Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good evening, everyone. It is Monday, January the 9th, 2023. It is currently 10.55 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. Now, you may be asking, why is he doing a live broadcast at almost 11 p.m. at night? I mean, what, 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 why is he doing that? Well, the reason I'm doing a live broadcast at, uh, at almost 11 p.m., well, very close to 11 p.m. at night, is because I am greatly bothered by something. I am frustrated. I am bothered. And it all has to do with our last live broadcast. We did a live broadcast talking about fasting for your breakthrough in 2023. Now, I called it Fasting for What, but we were utilizing an article that was published at the Christian Post or uh, on the Christian Post, their website, christianpost.com. And I believe the article was published yesterday and I saw it today, or maybe it was published today. And it was all about fasting for your breakthrough in 2023. And we, and the article was just so frustrating to me. It was so poorly written. It was so just, it was, it's hard to really explain, but I mean, and somewhere all of a sudden it started talking about, you can't see God in tight pants. It, it, It was just bizarre. I mean, the article was very frustrating and very disappointing. Now I know what you're thinking. Well, wait a minute. You should have read the article before you went live. I know I should have, but remember, I love those impromptu broadcasts, right? Where I'm sitting somewhere and I see something, I'm like, you know what? Let's talk about it. And I immediately run up here to the studio. I hit the big red go live button and I start talking so, to everyone. So I, I to someone, <laughs> hopefully there's more than just one person. I start talking to everyone about it. So today that's what happened. I saw this article about fasting and thought that should be an interesting conversation. And obviously I was naive to think that an article published at the Christian Post would be uh, would lead to great theological discussion when all it really led to was like, what in the world are they talking about It was so really, and in fact, by the time it ended, like on one hand, they were like, you fast so that you can get a breakthrough. You fast so that you can have the real power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, and you fast because of all of the health benefits, because those health benefits will help you be more spiritual because your physical well-being impacts your spiritual well-being and your spiritual well-being impacts your physical well-being. And they kind of went that direction. So their fasting for what was kind of like, well, if you don't do it, you don't get a spiritual breakthrough and you don't have the full Holy Spirit. And if you don't fast, you don't get the health benefits. And if you don't have the health benefits, well, then it's going to hurt you spiritually. I, I guess, is that a good way of summarizing that article? I don't know. By the time it was over, I was so frustrated. And so I went back to listen to the broadcast. To make it even worse, at, at a, I don't know, 40-minute mark, 41-minute mark, I don't know what in the world I was thinking, but I I mean, it was probably an accident because sometimes your 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 throat does different things. And so I did some kind of weird, I don't, I can't even do it, some weird kind of like trying to talk while trying to swallow. And it was this weird, I can't even, I can't even make my voice, my throat do it, do it right now. And I'm like, what in the world was that? So then I'm like, I know I'll pull the audio down and edit that. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just leaving it. I'm just leaving it. So the whole broadcast was just frustrating. All right. Um, Okay, good. All right, good, good, good. Someone just said, regardless of how bad the article was, it did bring about an interesting discussion. I hope it did. I hope it did. That that was that was my hope. But but by the time I went back and listened to it, I I I felt like man, I could have done a better job. But probably I could have done a better job if I was more prepared with what what the article was going to say. But at the same time, that would have taken away the impromptu feeling of it. So I don't know. I always have these back and forth arguments with myself. But I was just like, so what do I do? What do I do? You know, I. 
I, I can't just go to bed. I just can't go to bed with this. I, 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 I'll, and, and even if I don't go to bed, even if I decide to stay up all night, I, all I'm going to do all night is just go that last live broadcast. I've got to do something with it. So I started asking some questions about fasting and just trying to really think about it. And this, this really one major question that I guess I've been struggling with through most of the evening, other than, well, that broadcast went bad. How can I improve it? But really the question that's been haunting me for the last couple of hours is this. Is fasting commanded? Now, almost every article you look at, almost every Christian you talk to, all say, no, 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 fasting is not commanded. It's something, it's suggested. It's a private thing between you and God. You can either, you can take it or leave it. You can... Now, if you do it, you supposedly get wonderful benefits, but if you don't do it, you'll be okay. Uh, like now, now some will try to say it's not commanded, but then they'll come along and basically say, well, it's not commanded. However, if you don't fast, basically you don't have the Holy Spirit. You don't have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You're going to be spiritually weak and you're going to sin. And, and basically, even though they say it's not commanded, and, and that's kind of really, I, I think that that's just not being fair, Right. I think that's, that's not being genuine, right? Uh, if you're going to tell everyone, hey, s- s- fasting is not commanded. However, if you don't do it, basically, you're a second-class cr- Christian. You're whole, you don't have the full power of the Holy Spirit. You probably don't understand Scripture, and you're, and you're, and you're weak, and you're immature. And look, like, if, there, if there's like 900 things wrong with you because you don't fast— well, then why? That's disingenuous. Just say, just come out and say, look, you have to fast. It's commanded. You can't say it's not commanded, but basically you're trash if you don't do it. That's just not, that's not, that's, that, that really, that makes me more angry than, than that. But so I, I guess, I guess that makes me more angry for someone to say it's not commanded. And then basically <laughs> tell you that if you don't do it, you're garbage. That's just basically you're saying it is commanded, Right. Because, I mean, how can it be like, it's not commanded, but if you don't do it, everything's going to be wrong in your spiritual life. You just as well say it's commanded, right? I mean, I, I just don't understand that, that game that Christians play. So that bothers me greatly. On the other hand, there are some, and I think they're in the minority of the minority of the minority of the minority, that says, no, fasting is commanded. Now, I probably wouldn't give it much thought, but if you look it up, I think if you take the word fast and fasting and you look from Genesis to Revelation, I believe my numbers are correct. It's used over 70 times. I don't know the, I don't know if it was 71, 73, but it's around 70 times that if you take the word fast and fasting used from Genesis to Revelation, somewhere around 70 times. I should have written it down, but I looked it up to, to try to verify it. And I also saw it mentioned in a number of other articles. And I thought, well, that's, fasting is mentioned 70 times? That, and that's kind of started bothering me. I mean, like, that's mentioned more than baptism. That's mentioned more than the Lord's Supper. That's mentioned more than a lot of things. And there's a lot of things that's not even nowhere mentioned near that much that we're like, dogmatically, this is the way it must be. This is the way you must do church. This is the way you must preach. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Fasting is mentioned 70 times. And most people are like, take it or leave it. Now, some will be like, take it or leave it. And if you leave it, then you're garbage, which they're, they're basically telling you it's commanded. Others will say, no, it's absolutely commanded. There's just a, but I think the majority of Christians even if no matter, I think if the majority of Christians, no matter what they say, the reality is most Christians don't spend any meaningful time fasting. And those who do, sometimes it feels like they're doing so for health reasons and not for spiritual reasons. Even though they may say it's for spiritual reasons, they seem to spend a lot of time talking about, well, I lost weight or this. or And it's like, well, I, I, I think you've missed the point somewhere. So I just, it's just, it bothers me that something could be mentioned that many times in the Bible, but I don't feel that there's a lot of emphasis on it. So, you know, is it commanded? Is it commanded? Is it commanded? So that's kind of what I struggled with. And then I started thinking, okay, let's say that 90% of the passages of Scripture 
either there's no specific command to do it. So therefore, it's just said, if you do it, here's the way you should. All right, let's say that that's true. What about 1 Corinthians? Hear me out. I started thinking about a section of 1 Corinthians, a certain passage. And I started asking myself, okay, now wait a minute. Let's set aside fasting in general. I wonder if 1 Corinthians is giving us a command that in this particular situation that 1 Corinthians is talking about, this particular chapter, you do have to fast there. It's not a suggestion. It's basically spoken of as a command. And even if it's not a command, if it's suggested by an apostle writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, how, how strongly do we take said suggestion? And if we ignore the suggestion or the command in 1 Corinthians 7, then I don't, then, then does it really matter what we say about fasting in any of the other passages because we're not really being honest with ourselves? So, th- so that's what I decided to do this evening. At this late hour, I decided to turn on the microphone, go live. Now, if you have children nearby, I doubt you have them right now, but if you're listening to this tomorrow, you may want to move them out of the way right now. You may want to hit pause because I don't want to put you in a situation where you're going to have uh, maybe a conversation you don't want to have because of me. But tonight, we're going to talk about fasting and sex. Fasting and sex. You will understand why in just a minute. Some of you already know where I'm going. But I think we have to talk about this. And I, here's what I want you to understand. I do not. The, the goal of this broadcast is to not get into all of the issues found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 because that's where we're going to be. I'm not here to try to take it apart. There are so many issues here. It is a very sensitive subject that that I think has created lots of of frustration, maybe even pain, guilt, and shame on a lot of people. It is a it is a chapter that I don't think anyone necessarily loves to deal with, right? In any way, shape, or form, because it raises so many questions. But my goal here tonight is primarily to go, okay, let's say we say fasting is not commanded. Let's say that. What do we do with fasting as it appears in 1 Corinthians chapter 7? Now, before we get to the fasting, I'm going to be asking some kind of theoretical or hypothetical questions in regards to how we understand the verses that precede it. Because if we do, we do we understand the verses preceding it as saying, this is commanded, this is what you're supposed to do. And if all the verses before it seem to be dogmatic and commands, and then all of a sudden fasting appears, do we magically say, well, the fasting there is just suggested? Here we go. Oh boy, here we go. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, I think many would believe that this is just kind of a general principle, right? That it's good for a man not to touch a woman in this, and you'll see why. Not good, it's not good for a man to touch a woman, obviously, in, in before marriage. And here's the reason we think that that's clearly what's being referenced. Because look at this, look at verse two. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Are you saying it's good for a man to never touch a woman ever? It seems that the next verse provides us some kind of context. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, that's sexual immorality typically viewed as sexual immorality that occurs before marriage. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So clearly we can see where we're going. Now, I'm just going to be blunt. I've already given you a warning. I'm just going to be very blunt as we walk through this because we have to. It seems to be very dogmatic here, right? Hey, before you're married, it's probably a good idea not to touch. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, sexual immorality prior to marriage, the best way to avoid fornication 
because that is, listen, we're dealing with a natural desire. Let's make it very clear. The desire for sexual relation is not a sin. That desire is a natural desire. Now, what happens is we sometimes, that desire wants us to fulfill that desire in an unbiblical way. We all, everyone's experienced this in some way, shape, or form. You may not, you may say, back in my day, whatever. If you're a human being, there's about a 99.9% chance at some point you've had a desire to fulfill that desire for sex in a way that is not biblical. In some way, shape, or form, you know you've experienced it. We've all experienced it. I don't know why Christians act so <gasps> shocked that someone would desire sex or fulfill a sexual desire in an unbiblical way. It's always like the most scandalous thing. You can commit 900 sins and it's never a scandal. Anything that even has the letter S and X in it, it's the end of the world. Buildings crumble. The bombs go off. It's like it, it, it's like the worst sin in the history of mankind. Other things, it's okay. It's other. It's it's okay. It's it's really bizarre. But the reality is, human beings are sexual beings. They desire sex. It's a natural desire. There's nothing wrong or it's sinful about said desire. The issue is we 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 have thoughts of fulfilling that desire in an unbiblical way, and we have in many cases, engage in the action of fulfilling the desire in an unbiblical way. However, to try to avoid that area of sexual immorality, it's interesting that the Bible's suggestion is not pray more. (laughs) The Bible's suggestion is not go to church more. The Bible's suggestion is well, get married, have a wife or a husband so that therefore that desire can be fulfilled, right? In other words, it's just interesting. It's not like, hey, 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 pray more. No, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. If I go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in a different translation, Now, in response to the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to use a woman for sex. Now there, the touch becomes more blatant. Hey, it's good not to have sex with a woman, but, and obviously this is referenced to before marriage because, but because sexual immorality, it is so common because sexual immorality is so common. Each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman should have sexual relations with her own husband. Now, it states it a little bit differently, but it says, hey, sexual immorality is so common. Now, in the historical context, for the city of Corinth was well known for its sexual immorality. I mean, that, that's they, they had temple prostitutes. They had all kinds of issues. So he's saying, hey, 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 sexual immorality is super common. The way to avoid it is marriage so that you can have sex with your marriage partner. Now, Let's be, now this, this though, (laughs) we could talk about the uh, unintended consequences of this teaching. And there's no way to get around it. The Christianity teaches that sex outside of marriage is sinful. Sex inside of marriage isn't. Once you're married, then only with that individual. That the, the Bible's teaching is clear. We all know it. We all know it. But there's some unintended consequences from this. Because I think in many cases, what can happen is you have two Christian young people that they're obviously are going to have the desire. I mean, come on. I mean, I mean, look, you, we we can try to we can try to pretend we live in a Disney TV show, but if we're honest with ourselves, those young people are overwhelmed with that desire. Everything in their body is screaming, fulfill this desire, fulfill this desire. And Christians, the Christian answer is, well then get married. And so sometimes I think it can lead Christian young people to getting married very young, maybe even before they're ready to be married, and in many cases, maybe not marrying the person that maybe they're not most compatible with because, well, the, hey, I, this is the person I'm with and I want to have sex. It, it, there are unintended consequences. There's just no way to get around it. There's just no way to get around it. There's just no way to get around it because it's like, hey, it's better it's better to get married than to, to be struggling every, every minute of every day with this desire that's going to absolutely destroy me. And because, again, you know what happens. 
You can have teenagers who can commit 900 sins and they're okay. They get caught committing sexual sin. It's the end of the world. It's shame. It's humiliation. It's everything. All right, so far, so good. Now, here's where it gets really, really touchy when it gets to the marriage relationship. Now, we're, we're, gonna, we're working to get to the fasting. I'm just trying to work through this so that we understand. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Now, if we read this from a different translation, a husband should fulfill the marital duty to his wife, and the likewise a wife to her husband. Now, this seems to imply, if you follow the, 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 the logical flow of thought here, if, you, if we follow this, if we follow this, it seems to be pretty clear. Hey, before you're married, don't, be, don't, don't have sex. To avoid fornication, to avoid sex before marriage, get married, have sex with your partner. Now, in that relationship, the husband should be taking care of the wife. The wife should be taking care of the husband. That's the way it's supposed to work. Now, this can lead to serious issues. If, 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 hey, to avoid fornication, get married. If that has unintended consequences, this has created unintended consequences, especially in some marriages where, where people feel like I can't, uh, in fact, I mean, we've had Christian pastors literally tell the woman that she can't say no, which can lead to some serious issues about consent, basically about basically almost uh, rape within marriage. I mean, you, you can get into some really dark questions here, but the general principle, and now again, now uh, this is a question. Is this a general principle or is this a, com a command? Now I can try to reduce it to the general principle, but I think most believe that these are very specific instructions. That in marriage, the husband is to take care of the wife and the wife is to take care of the husband. And then here, here's the way it's supposed to work. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise, also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Now, many make this to sound like that no one can ever say no. And I think we got to be very careful with that. The point is, I'm there to take care of her. She's there to take care of me. And that's supposed to be the way it works. And the reason why is because this is the relationship that's supposed to protect you from sexual immorality outside of it. All right. Everybody knows this passage. And, and, and I, I do not know how every, uh, trust me, anyone who's a Christian and married as probably this passage is either heaped large amounts of guilt Large amount, amount, a large amount of shame upon certain individuals. It may be a, become a source of great frustration, maybe a source of great pain, and it may have even been used in a horrible way that could lead to abuse of some kind. I mean, there, there are some major issues with this, and nobody really wants to talk about this passage because it is uncomfortable. Now, some want to talk about it, and they usually do it in those, the, the quote-unquote sex sermon series. Mark Driscoll's currently promoting one he's getting ready to do, on, and I guess him and his wife wrote a book, and hey, basically how to make you know sex great again. Um, and that, now when pastors preach those kinds of sermons, they sometimes then turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, but it's almost done in a more flippant, joking way. There's, there's a real dark side to all of this. And I don't know if anyone ever wants to talk about it. Now, this comes to verse 5. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. I'm going to come over here. Do not deprive one another, except when you agree for a time. Now, these verses, how do you take these verses? Do you take these as just, well, this is just a suggestion? Or do you say, this is what God is telling us how to conduct ourselves in marriage? This is really the question because you've got to answer this. How serious do, how does serious do you take these verses? 
There seems to be, there's supposed to be a mutual agreement and nobody is to defraud the other, except there is, and the way it says, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. Now, you got to be careful how this works, because once again, there's a potential danger here, right? Hey, hey, you can't defraud me. You can't say no. Well, that that is dangerous, right? I think the point is, is the, the, I, I, the, the instruction seems to be together. Unless there is consent not to be. Now, the minute there is consent not to be, for whatever the reason may be. Now, here comes the part. Here we go. To fraud you not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Now, here we have fasting. Is this a, now, how do you view all of this? Is all of this just a suggestion? Hey, guys, hey, guys, look, I'm just su- suggesting something to you. Hey, in your marriage, here's kind of a suggested way that I, as an apostle, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we just wanted to throw out this kind of suggestion and how sex within marriage should work. We just want to throw this out there. This is the way it should work. Well, one, it would be interesting to know how even close this actually works in the lives of most church members, most Christians. Again, I think this can become a source of great frustration, great frustration. But if you say that this is more than a suggestion, this is spoken of as this is what you're supposed to do, well, then here's, this is where it comes this is where the fasting question comes into play. Anytime two married people, by consent, say we're not going to be together, they're supposed to give themselves to fasting and prayer. I'm going to read it from a different translation. Do not deprive one another, except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Now, this translation removes the word fasting completely from it. This translation leaves it completely out. I'm looking here at their note. Um, Other manuscripts add fasting. So some manuscripts add, now we can get into the whole textual variant issue and why some manuscripts have it and some manuscripts don't. Should we see fasting in it? But if we say fasting is here, now how do we understand this? It seems to me that it's a, that the way it's supposed to work, hey, we're not going to be together. Now we're going we're gonna to fast and we're going to pray together. Now, why would you give yourself to fasting and pray? Okay, we can't be together. We can't have sex. So we're going to fast and pray. And obviously this would be together. You're consenting not to be together. Now you're going to fast and pray. And why are you going to fast and pray? You're going to fast and pray and come together again that Satan tempts you not for your incontinency. Uh, for And, and the, another translation uses this uh, uses this phrase. Say, how does this translation uses it? Uh, King James uses incontinency, I think is the word there. Uh, this translation, your, uh, 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 otherwise Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Because of your lack of self-control. In other words, it seems to say, hey, we're, you're sexual beings. Yeah, you got married because you couldn't stop having premarital sex or you felt like you were going to fall into that. So you got married to avoid premarital sex. Well, now that you're married, you need to have sex with each other, taking care of each other completely. And then whenever you say we're not going to be together, you immediately give yourself to prayer and to fasting so that Satan will not tempt you. Now, I think some people would be like, well, this is ridiculous. It's not like the temptation is that strong, right? Some people would be like, and, and, and again, it can be, 
Sometimes it may be the man, you know, who for whatever reason doesn't no longer has the desire and be like, what's your problem? I mean, what's your, come on, it's not that big a deal. Just control your desire. And it may be the woman looking at the man going, what's your issue? Come on, come on. I mean, I'm done with that now. I don't, I don't have the desire the way I used to. It's not, it's, it's not. So just get, come on, use some self-control. Here, Paul is like, no, no, you got to fast and pray so that Satan won't tempt you. Now, this raises all kinds of questions. Well, so will fasting and prayer stop the temptation? I don't think it stops the temptation. I think what this does is, is food and sex are very similar. Like, like sometimes people can't understand. Like it, it, it sometimes it kind of, it kind of blows me away. Like sometimes people can't understand individual struggles with sex or, 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 or any struggles or failures in sex because they're like, that's just, that's a bridge too far, but give me a break. You, everyone can relate to the desire for food, right? Well, the desire for sex in some people is as strong, if may not even be stronger than that for food. Now, if you don't have that struggle, you're like, I don't get it. Look, some people struggle with food. I don't get that. I don't get that. I, first of all, food irritates me. Okay. I don't, I, I, I would prefer not to ever eat because it seems to be a waste of time. And also with me, when I start eating the very second, the very second I even feel like I'm getting close to that feeling of full, I stop because I don't like that feeling of full. I just stop. It's no big deal. I just stop. I, I'm done. I'm not going to take another bite. And there's been only a few, there's a few times where I love the food and I'm like, oh, I'm going to keep eating. But I, I, even then I've never gotten, gotten to that feeling where other people are like, I am so full. I think I'm going to be sick. I, no way. I'm not even going to get close to that. So for other people, I'm like, what's your problem? What's your pro? Why do all you care about food? What? Like, uh, I don't get it because I don't have that issue. So it's interesting that fasting is kind of thrown in here, at least in many of the manuscripts, not all of the manuscripts. Seemingly to say that the desire for sex is so strong that you have to give yourself to fasting and prayer. Now, is this simply a suggestion or is it a command? Now, this is where the next verse c- creates much disagreement in the world of Christianity. Here we go. All right. I'm going to read uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Defraud ye not the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission, and not of a commandment. For I would that all men were even as I myself, meaning single, But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. So when he says, I speak this by permission and not of a command, is he speaking of that which he just said? Or is he speaking of what he's getting ready ready to say that he, he wishes all men were single? Is it referring to what came before or does it refer to come what comes after? If it's referring to what come before, then you can't say fasting. You can't say any of that is, is commanded. Oh, that's just a suggestion. You, you can either follow it or not follow it. But it would seem weird that, hey, 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 this is so serious that we're saying, no, don't defraud each other unless it's by consent. And the minute you're not together, you need to pray and fast because Satan's going to tempt you. But hey, guys, hey, guys, I, I mean, that's just a suggestion. It's not really a command. That seems odd to me. Uh, this translation uh, says this. Um, I say this as a concession, not as a command. That's how another translation. Now, he says what as a concession? What he just said or what he's getting ready to say? Now, if we look this up and if we look at commentaries, we'll see if there's any agreed upon. There's any agreed upon. How much agreement? I guess we'll say that. Is there an agreed upon interpretation of this? If I can type right. If I can type right. First Corinthians chapter seven. What verse is that? First Corinthians chapter seven. I'm going to go to my other Bible. That is verse six. 
1 Corinthians 7, 6, and they, and, and you can just look up on any app where there's sermons and see how many sermons interpret uh, verse 6, which, which way. Um, here's what the, uh, com- well, <laughs> I was going to say, where, here, where's the comment? Here's the commentary. All right. I, but I speak this by permission. Better, now I say this as a permission and not as a command. As the passage is given in our English ver- version, It might seem as if the apostle implied that he had no actual command, but only a permission to write this, which is not at all the meaning. What he does say is that foregoing, that the foregoing instructions are not to be considered as absolute commands from him, but as general permissive instruction to be applied to each individual according to circumstances. It has been much discussed as to what part of the previous passage the word this refers. Is it perhaps best to take it as referring to the leading through the leading thought of the whole passage, which is that marriage is allowable, especially in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 2. In other words, is the point that he's trying to say is, hey, marriage is not command. Now, so, so what they're saying is what, what he's saying is, I speak this by permission, not as a command, is that you're not commanded to get married, but you have the permission to get married if you find yourself in danger of committing premarital sex. That that's the permission part. I'm not commanding you to get married, but you are free. You are permitted to get married. Now, if you get married, here's what you're to do. And that is a command. The pulpit commentary. I speak this, that this applies to his advice in general, but especially to the last verse. By permission, this phrase is generally misunderstood. It does not mean that St. Paul was permitted, though not committed, commanded to give this advice, but that it was gentle advice was given by way of permission to Christians, not by way of injunction. He means to say that he leaves the details of their lives, whether celibate or married, to their individual consciences, though with large hearted wisdom and charity, he would emancipate them from human and unauthorized restrictions. The clause is not therefore a parallel to the restrictions on the authority of his utterances, such as we find in other passages of scripture. This seems to kind of go with the idea that again, that he's saying, hey, look, 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 you can either live a life of celibacy and not be married, or you can be married. That is what I'm not commanding you on that. But are the rest of those instructions commands? If so, we would have a specific situation where we're kind of commanded to fast, right? Um, Okay, but I speak this by permission. It is not quite certain whether the word this in this verse refers to what precedes or to what follows. On this, commentators are divided. The more natural and obvious interpretation would be to refer to the preceding statement. I am inclined to think that the the mere natural construction is the true one and that Paul refers to what he had said in 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Most recent commentators, however, suppose it refers to what follows and appears to similar places in Joel, Psalms, and 1 Corinthians 10. Calvin supposes it refers to what he said in 1 Corinthians 7, 1. All right. So nobody can agree. Nobody can agree on this. Nobody. All right. So let's just make it very clear. Nobody can agree. And this passage leads to too much. Now there's, there's clearly, he's not commanding everyone to get married because other places he seems to say, I mean, he just, he's getting ready to say right there. He wishes all people could be like him, which seems to imply singleness. Right. Hey, it would be good if everyone could be single. But if you can't be, in fact, he goes on to say, I think he does go on to say, but if they cannot contain, let them marry for it is better to marry. So clearly we know that people are not commanded to get married. They have the permission to get married, but there are benefits in staying single. However, if you can't do that, then get married. That seems to be the more I'm not commanding you. But that those instructions in marriage, it seems that 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 consider how considering the serious stakes that he's kind of 
explaining, hey, hey, look, 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 look. If you can't be together, you have to fast and pray because Satan's going to tempt you. Well, that, that, that seems like it would be weird to say, hey, guys, look, here's the deal. I got a suggestion. All right. I, I just need you to know this. If you can't be together in a sexual relationship and you agree to, to not be together, you need to immediately fast and pray because Satan's out there to tempt you. But, but don't take it too seriously. I mean, you can take it or leave it. To me, it seems like a command. Now, here's the problem. Nobody follows it. Nobody. 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 <laughs> Nobody. Now, I'm, I want to say nobody. Okay, let me say this. I don't know everyone at all times, but I would say the majority, 99% of Christians, do not fast and pray when they aren't together physically. Hey, we haven't been together for whatever reason it may be. Physical, it could be emotional. There could be a million reasons why people aren't together because of they're separated because of work or a, a deployment in the military. Okay, we're going to both fast and pray. Now, exactly how much time do you fast and pray? Do you go without one meal each day and pray uh, during that time? Do you go without two meals? How much, I mean, like it doesn't lay out the instructions, but obviously what you're trying to do is like, hey, my body, I have to, I, my body is not going to be able to be satisfied sexually. So I'm going to, I'm going to have it not be satisfied with food so that I, in a sense, uh, is trying to train my body to live without Now, but not all translations say fast. So we have a textual issue. We got a million issues with 1 Corinthians 7. We got a million issues here. So which would imply to me that it's hard to be dogmatic. But I had to address this because I just think that when, I think it's easy to say, hey, it's never commanded but this would be the passage to me that would give me the closest to going, whoa, 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 whoa. That, that sounds very specific, especially considering like the King James uses the word uh, fasting. I wonder how many English translations put the word fasting there. That's 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Let's, let me go look. Let's, let's look at how many mention it. Let's look here. I need to, we need to go, I need to go all the way back. Hang on, here we go. Um, all right, let's see here. The NIV removes fasting. New Living Translation removes fasting. The ESV removes fasting. Berean, uh, the Berean Standard Bible removes fasting. Um, the Berean literal Bible removes fasting. King James has fasting. New King James has fasting. New American Standard removes fasting. New American Standard 1995 removes fasting. New American Standard 1977 removes fasting. A Legacy Standard Bible removes fasting. The Amplified Bible removes fasting. The Christian Standard Bible removes fasting. The Holman Christian Bible removes fasting. The American Standard Version removes fasting. The Arama Aramaic Bible in plain English has fasting. Contemporary English Version uh, removes fasting. Dewey Reams removes fasting. English Revised removes fasting. God, God's Word translation removes fasting. Good News translation removes fasting. And uh, the ISV removes fasting. Literal uh, Standard uh, no, includes fasting. Majority Standard includes fasting. New American removes fasting. The Net Bible removes fasting. So the majority of translations removes Webster's Bible translation includes fasting. Uh, the World, World English Bible includes fasting. The Young's Literal Translation includes fasting. So when you get there, most of them do not. Um, okay, good. Someone just made a very interesting point here. Um, now, we it, it, their point they make here also could raise other questions, but 
Uh, Corinthians seems to have several commands that people seem to uh, not follow, women being silent in the church. Now, silent in the church in which way? Is that in conjunction to tongues? Or is that in conjunction, period? Head coverings, now it depends on what we understand the head coverings are. Head coverings is a head covering, or is it is the woman's hair her hair covering? Then if it's that, then then how long should the woman's hair be? But we, we can get into discussions. But I agree, there's lots of issues in 1 Corinthians that were like, wait a minute, this seems to be a command, but we find a way to get around said command. Now, if fasting, if we go with the te- text that has fasting, then is fasting commanded here? I would put this way. If it's not commanded, that, that's got to be one of the strongest suggestions of, I mean, that would basically be telling you, look, you do this or sexual temptation is right around the corner. Now, we also would have to realize, well, wait a minute. There are some people who are married and because of health reasons of one partner or the other, you may end up in a situation where that's not going to be happening ever, ever again or never again or very rarely again. Now, if that's the case, how, how, I mean, how much do you fast every day for that? Does, does both of you fast every day? Like, Hey, we, we may never, ever be able to be together again. So every day at what, at lunch, you skip lunch, you just go, you just go down to two meals a day. So not only do you spend your life not having physical relationships, you also spend your life now eating less food than you've ever eaten. I don't know. Would that, you just, just seems like that that's a recipe for some like explosive frustration in the home. The text is puzzling to me. The text has led to some serious issues in the lives of many people because I don't know if the church has a good handle on this passage because I don't know if the passage lends itself to truly understanding it. Now, usually it's young couples or it can be a young couple or or some guy who's, you know, thinks he's got it figured out. He'll be very dogmatic like that's the way it's going to be. And they talk a big game until, well, life takes place. And then all of a sudden they realize, well, maybe maybe it's not as simple as I thought. Again, pastors love to pull this out on their sex sermon series. They love that because it's, ooh, it, it's, it's you know, that that's going to generate some, some controversy and some buzz. And you're going to get some downloads and get some streams. I understand that. But that even that that's handled almost in a flippant way. It's like, and it's everyone's laughing about it, and and, and they make it more. Of, and I understand you try to maybe make it more fun to approach it because it takes away the the awkwardness. You try to break the ice. The only problem is though, it leads people going home, going, well, hey, you can't say no to me. You you don't have power of your body. I have power of your body. I mean, that can, you open up yourself, you open up the potential for great abuse of it. Now, just because someone abuses the truth does not, dis, does not make the truth not valid, right? A truth is not deemed not, a truth is not deemed untrue because of one's abuse of said truth. We condemn the abuse of the truth, but we still have to deal with the reality of the truth. Many people have abused the truth of scripture doesn't make the scripture less true. So that, that, that's something sometimes people in the world don't understand. Well, cr- people have ab- abused the Bible. It doesn't make it not true. We just want to condemn the abuse of it. So this is definitely leads to some serious conversations within marriage. And they're not always easy to deal with. And it can lead to lots of guilt. Can lead to serious guilt. Because people's desire fluctuates. Age, health, life. Well, if if one person's desire drops to uh, just using random numbers to like a 10 and the other person's desire is an 80 and the person's like, hey, hey, the Bible says that one whose desire is down to 10, guess what? 
they don't live in gain and, and they live a life of guilt and shame, or they have to now participate where they're not really giving true consent internally. That's horrifying. That's horrible. You don't want that. You don't want that in any way, shape, or form. Because that will ultimately be that will ultimately be devastating to the marriage. I mean, it will be because you're going to build up resentment and hatred. So that's where the other person has to be sensitive to the person whose desire is gone and say, "Okay, well, we can't be. We're not going to be. We're going to be together much less than we've ever been. Now we're going to spend more time in prayer and fasting. I think what typically happens is it stops, the frequency goes down, usually, not always. One person is more frustrated by it than the other person, but nobody is praying and fasting because they say the prayer and fasting there is just suggested and not commanded. Not a pleasant topic, I know. Okay, hey, you're like, well, I'm so glad I tuned into this. I, I know it's not a pleasant topic. There's so many issues here. But I just feel like if there's ever a passage that would seem to lead me to feeling like, man, this makes it feel like this fasting here is non-negotiable. The only thing that would, I guess, is the way out of it is to argue that most translations remove fasting. And prayer would be much easier to accomplish because it wouldn't tell you how long you have to pray. So it'd be much easier to accomplish, right? Hey, we can't be together. Let's pray for, you know, let's pray for five or 10 minutes together. I mean, I mean, that 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 could be pulled off. I mean, I, I, there would be no excuse for couples not to be able to pray together. I mean, that, everyone can pull that off. Right? Everyone can pull that off. Now, I think what happens is, especially those who are, are in churches that are heavy King James, I think what they feel like, look, if we're not doing the fasting, who even, why even care about the prayer? I mean, we're already disobeying the scripture. Well, well hey, we're not going to do the fasting part, but we'll do the prayer part. I mean, I, I think there was a part of you that'd be like, what's the point? Because every time we pray, we know we're not doing the fasting. Therefore, we're, ju- we're just going to be feel guilty and it's not going to make anyone feel better. But if fasting is not really there, if we go with that argument, that textual argument, then everyone could at least do the prayer part. Lots of questions about 1 Corinthians 7. I don't have any good, I, someone say, well, you need to do a lengthy series on 1 Corinthians 7. Look, I could, I could spend 10 years in this passage and we still would not have any definitive answers. Nobody agrees on it. Nobody agrees on it in church history. There's just massive disagreement upon it. That's frustrating because it's the word of God. So we have to take it seriously. But I'm just saying sometimes you just have to acknowledge, I don't know if there's a good answer. I think what we can take from 1 Corinthians 7 is this. The desire for sex is real. It is strong. There's grave danger when you're not married to fall into sexual sin. In marriage, there's supposed to be some protection. Now, especially for the church at Corinth, this was a big deal because temple prostitutes would come into the city to engage basically, hey, you could worship God by sleeping with a temple prostitute. Who wouldn't want to go to that church, right? I mean, I'd be like, hey, I can worship God by sleeping with a temple prostitute. Well, the way to protect them is the marriage relationship is in that area is so strong that hopefully it prevents the other. Just from a purely physical, uh, just a purely physical perspective, just, I mean, this is not talking about emotions or anything else. This would just be purely from a physical perspective. So you can understand how it fits in the historic and the historical context. So we, we clearly, this seems to imply the desire for sex is real and it is strong. Marriage is supposed to help protect you. And because it's supposed to protect you, both individuals need to be committed to the other person's satisfaction. And then, and then there is a, 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 a there there we with by consent you can abstain, but then you immediately give yourself over to prayer and fasting so that you will not be tempted for 
this or for your lack of self-control or, for, or, or just an acknowledgement because the desire is so strong. A, it's interesting It's interesting to me that, now we got to be careful how we say this, but I just think it's interesting that whenever there's prob- fa- failure, sin in this particular area, there's usually a not a lot of discussions where did things break down somewhere in the 1 Corinthians 7 department? Now, I, that could be used as an excuse by the guilty party, and that would be wrong. That would not be right. I'm not saying that there's any excuse, but I think that we always have to, like, this seems to be very laid out. Like, hey, this is the way to do this. It's 1 Corinthians 7, one of those passages that we all kind of know it's there, but nobody really wants to talk about. I understand. It, it's it's not It's not a... It's a very sensitive subject. Trust me, I don't want to be talking. I mean, I I don't really want to be talking about it right now. I'm just talking about it because, because when I think about fasting, it's like there's a lot of like, well, just take it or leave it. But this seems to be like, I don't, you can't take it or leave it there. I don't know. Can you? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm going to have to stop. We're at 56 minutes. It's almost midnight here in West Texas. <laughs> it's, not, it's not what I really wanted to be talking about, but the article so ticked me off that we read earlier uh, in, the, in the evening on that live broadcast. That ticked me off so bad. I, that, that article was just so, I don't even know what that was. I mean, come on, if you're going to talk about this subject, you, you got to at least, well, I, I, maybe not. Maybe if you know, never look at the King James, there's some people who have never read the King James, never even looked at the King James. So that means most people who don't use the King James may never even realize fasting could possibly be mentioned here in 1 Corinthians 7. The only reason I, I the when I read that article and then I just started, you know, thinking about fasting, like, is this commanded or not commanded? I, I'm very cynical over it. And, and this is this verse, this passage is one of the reasons I'm very cynical about Christians talking about fasting. It, it really is. And look, it may be it may be wrong of me, but I've kind of like, look, I'm sick and tired of people talking about fasting when no one follows 1 Corinthians 7. They don't even follow the suggestion. Okay. Now, if fasting is supposed to be there, no one follows it. Now, I'm when I say no one, obviously someone somewhere does. But I'm saying the majority of people don't even get, you can go to any church on any given Sunday and be like, okay, I don't know how many times you were together this week, but on the times that you weren't, did you fast and pray? And people would be like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> Give me a break. So then that makes me realize, well, then come on, why, why, why play the game about how important fasting is? You see, so I become kind of cynical. And then I also become very cynical over it because everyone thinks like, if you fast, then boom, now you get the fullness of the Holy Spirit. If you fast, boom, you get the spiritual breakthrough. Boom, if you fast, now you have supernatural power. And I, I, have, I have issues with that. I think fasting is simply denying the body of a very basic, basic, basic need and desire so that you can discipline your body to do without that which is a basic need and desire which can then help discipline your body to be better prepared to handle those kinds of issues because there's con- the Christian life is one of self-denial. All right. Not a pleasant topic. I, 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 some may say, well, why isn't it a pleasant topic? Because I just feel that there are lots of people who are in situations that this is a Oh, that this is not a pleasant ver- chapter. And they're like, well, what am I supposed to do? All right, I, there, there's not easy answers. All right. 
I'll stop there. You can email me, newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. We didn't answer all the questions about fasting, but if you read that as fasting belonging in 1 Corinthians 7, I think it now adds a whole new layer to the discussion about fasting and how does that play out, whether you see that as a suggestion or a command, right? And it would be a weird suggestion considering the possible ramifications of not doing it. I think this, I think the quote unquote, the suggestion or the permission is about getting married, but okay. Um, if you, if you see it simply as a suggestion, it has to be the, it has to be one of the strongest suggestions in the Bible about why you should do something. And then you would have to then look at how that all plays out. I don't have any easy answers. But it's, it's right there in the Bible, so we have to talk about it. We have to talk about it. All right, news, if at yahoo.com. News, if at yahoo.com. News, if at yahoo.com. I don't know if you can hear. There is someone somewhere around my house, and I guess they're working on, it sounds like an old like pickup truck. And literally every, I, I, like they pull into the driveway somewhere and I think they do some like working, fine tuning it. And then they start driving it. And as soon as they pull out, it's like, pa, 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 pa. it's like backfiring. Like it sounds like guns going up. I don't know how many times I've sat here t- this evening going, someone is shooting. I mean, I live in Texas, so, you know, guns. Okay. All right. But, but I'm like, what is happening? But yeah, someone working on a truck and I kind of want to say, Hey, it's, you're going to, I don't care. It doesn't bother me. You can be as loud, you can be my neighbor and be as loud as you want to be. You can have the music blasting. You, I don't care what you're doing. You can have 500 people in your yard making all the noise you want, and I will never complain. I don't care. You can be firing off fireworks at three in the morning. I don't care. Make all the noise you want because then nobody can complain about the noise I make. Okay. That's, that's, so I'm, I'm easy to get along with. But when I hear that, I'm like, there's someone is getting ready to get mad. I always want to go down there and be like, Hey man, I'm trying to look out for you. Someone's going to get mad because that thing is loud. I don't know. I don't even know. Maybe the, the, the entire exhaust system is missing, but it's like, pop, 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 pop. I, I know you don't really care, but I just heard it a few minutes ago and thought, what in the world is going on? That's what's happening here. In West Texas, as someone's trying to fine tune their truck so that it will run smoothly. Well, we've tried to fine tune 1 Corinthians 7. And I don't have any easy answers for it. I don't. And I don't even know if fasting belongs in it. If you would have asked me five or ten years ago, I would have been like, fasting is there. Fasting is there. I probably wouldn't even have considered that. But now, that's why I continue. That's why I never rely on previous notes on any new study. All right. Thanks for listening. Now now I feel like, now I've got a second win today. Now I'm like, I'm going to broadcast from midnight to 6 a.m. All right. But I, I'm going to try not to do that. Because last night I didn't go to bed till what, five in the morning? Yeah. And so... I'm going to go listen to podcast. That's what I'm going to go do. All right. But email me. Newsif at yahoo.com. I am curious. I am curious really quick. Okay. I know you don't care about this. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. I was curious. How many people would listen to us broadcasting on the Sermons 2.0 app at 1158 p.m.? And the numbers are, it appears to be zero, okay? It appears to be zero, okay? that That's the big numbers we have in the Sermons 2.0 app. Uh, I don't know on the Spreaker app. I say, I don't think it shows me. Um, I, I think it will show, hang on. I don't think it shows. Let me look here. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm laughing to myself. Let's see here. I don't think it, uh, no, it won't show me right now. It won't show me until it's over. It won't show me until it's over. I know one person's listening I'm on the Spreaker app. Yeah, I don't think it will currently show me, but that's okay. That's, 
That's just funny. I go to the Sermons 2.0 app and it says zero. I don't think I've ever had a zero on the Sermons 2.0 app. I'm like, wow, we're doing really good. Okay, but that's all right. Okay, everything looks good. All right, thanks for uh, listening. And uh, I... You know what? If you have questions or struggles or difficulties or you've been harmed by 1 Corinthians 7, someone's abuse of it, and uh, if we need to come back and, and talk or clarify anything in regards to the passage, please let me know because I do, I, I am very sensitive to the passage. I am very sensitive to the passage because uh, I've read too many things of some horrific things that have taken place. And sadly, the horrific things taking place typically happens in regards to a woman who this is used basically to say, you cannot say no, you will do this. It is your job. And uh, mm, that bothers me greatly. That bothers me greatly. But at the same time, I can't just disregard the chapter. Right? I can't just disregard the chapter. It would be like me as a man not wanting to study what Jesus said about looking at a woman with lust because it makes me uncomfortable and I know how guilty I've been of that in my life, right? So, well, don't talk about it. Now, you, you, we got to deal with we got to deal with the parts that make us uncomfortable. We got to deal with the parts that are troubling. We got to deal with the parts that are difficult. I mean, that's that's the thing. It's the whole book, and whether we like it or not. Look, I mean, look, I don't, every time I read the Bible, if I was only going to study the passage of scripture that one, I didn't feel guilty about, or I wasn't guilty of, I probably wouldn't study my Bible at all. Because every time I open it, I find something that I'm guilty of, or something that I've struggled with, or something that I have not handled correctly. So some of these passages are difficult and are uncomfortable, but we got to be willing to look at it. All right. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. Every newsif at yahoo.com. Everyone have a great night. We are going to possibly create an outro. Uh, Okay, (laughs) with this title, someone said with this title, I would have expected thousands listening live. Well, either there's, (laughs) they're probably being sarcastic, but the reason the title has no impact is on Sermons 2.0 and on the Church One app, no title, they don't see the title. They can't see the title. The title is only for those on Spreaker. And uh, the the uh, the Spreaker live audience is well, I don't know which is bigger. It just depends on the time of day. But uh, the ti- your my title has no bearing on sermons two point or church one. They don't see the title. They won't see the title until I upload that sermon here in just a few minutes. Now we will see once that sermon once this message this broadcast is uploaded to the uh, sermons two point app. It will be interesting to see how many people click on it or how many people go, uh-huh, I'm not listening to that. I don't know. I, I have a feeling that this is just going to, I feel I feel like this entire broadcast is just going to backfire on me in some way, shape, or form because I, it's just, this just such an un, a difficult subject to deal with. All right, now I'm going to stop talking because now see, you, you, can hear, you can hear in my voice that that excitement. I've, I'm, I'm glad because I've, I've been feeling like I've been struggling for the last four weeks. Maybe I can get past the struggle. We can get down to business and get things done. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great night. Oh, I was saying we are going to try to create an outro where I won't just say, thanks for listening. Click. We're going to, I can click and and I can play something. So we may create an outro. Um, I don't know exactly what I want it to say. And we'll, we'll probably do a hire someone to do the voiceover and then have music and uh, but we're, we're going to try to come up with something or maybe we'll just find music and I'll purchase the music and it will be the outro for the uh, Theology Central podcast. We have our outro for the Today's Focus series, but we need an outro here. So maybe I'll come up with some outro music and uh, well, I'll, I'll come up with some suggestions and, and the Discord channel people. Uh, I'll try to say, hey, which one do you, does everyone pick? And we'll see if we can find a decent one. All right. Thanks for listening. Everyone have a great night. God bless.